Welcome to Pods with Posh and Paul, a podcast designed to inspire and challenge listeners through story, experience and insight. To face adversity, learn from suffering and discover how to embrace life with a heart filled with love and gratitude. We are so thrilled to have you journey with us and can't wait to share your stories. Join Sue O'Callaghan and Joanne Webb as we disrupt the theory that everyone has perfect lives. Hi, welcome and thanks for listening. Today we are thrilled to have with us an American cartoonist, illustrator, painter and novelist who kept a diary through her teenage years. Years that were filled with angst and searching for love but confusing it for sex after she lost her virginity to her mother's boyfriend when she was only 15. And based on her diaries, The Diary of a Teenage Girl was published in 2002. The book presents a complex look into the inner feelings and emotions of an adolescent girl. It is described as an autobiography or semi-autobiography. The Diary of a Teenage Girl was made into a film and released in 2015 at the Sundance Film Festival. Amazon described the film as a sharp, funny and provocative account of one girl's sexual and artistic awakening without judgment. Here to talk about life then and life now is the raw, real and honest Phoebe Gleckner. Hi Phoebe, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Hi Joe, how are you doing? Yeah, we're Sue good. Yes, yeah, Sue and Joe, you're right, correct. Um, right, we have been having a look at your beautiful book, and um, the Diary of a Teenage Girl, which has been made into a movie. Um, it's got so many messages within that book, within that movie, hasn't it? Um, you know, there's so many teenagers out there looking for love and acceptance in the wrong place. So, can you just tell us a little bit about how you come to write the book and a little bit about your experiences? Sure. Well, um, I usually beat around the bush and obfuscate my relationship to the book, but it's actually everything that happened in the book happened to me. So, uh, and I did, I kept all my diaries from the time I was a child. So I had the diaries from those particular years and they were kind of burning a hole in the back of my head. You know, I kept remembering and then I finally looked at them again, and I was just so, I don't know, I guess enraged. At one, I, I, and I guess I'm saying that because um, it just felt to me like the voice of that particular girl who, I mean, t- time enough had passed that I wasn't immediately recognizing her as myself because it was a different time i i felt like her voice was something that i hadn't read and i i felt that i needed to give that girl a voice i just think that's such a powerful message isn't it within each one of us as an adult there is our childhood voice there's a child in there that needs healing or needs speaking to it needs addressing or it needs recognition and actually we are all adult and child through our whole journey of life aren't we i love the fact that you diarized i also kept diaries but i have to say my diaries i i did one of these huge page a day diaries for most of my teenage years and probably a bit before, they're all in a container in storage somewhere in England. I've never read them since. I love the fact you've read them. I'd love to see who my teenage girl was. And I think she was very traumatized actually. And I think if the child protection had read it, they would have probably removed me from my parents because I was so screwed up in many ways with my emotions and feelings and just so much that needed to be written down. And diaries are such an important part, aren't they, of your journey to document your feelings. Do you, Through what you've written through i know your your book is now a play and it's also a film adaptation is it something that you know 50 percent of girls keep diaries what's what's your sort of feedback in terms of people that keep diaries well i think nowadays it may be different i think you know a teenager's diary may be something that exists on twitter or 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 something you know yeah Uh, that or something or some app that we can't have access to because we're grown-ups and mm. they password protect it, you know? <laughs> so I think it, it's different, but I think that, I mean, teenagers are figuring out who they are. And the way to do that is to like, look at yourself, try everything out. And words seem to almost like 
solidify something and make it more tangible so you can see yourself mm-hmm. do you know what i'm saying yeah and so you know when you got hold of your teenage diaries and you said they were burning a hole inside you you knew they were there was it really really confronting reading them again yeah well i had read them earlier and the thing was when i was a teenager i really despised myself you know i was ugly i was just a loser you know any any you know i was convinced that i was just a piece of shit and um so i read the diaries when i was in my 20s and i was just so horrified because i still felt those feelings of shame and self-hatred um and so i couldn't read them objectively or with any love and i just like put them away and then years later when i was more of an adult i read them again and i had kids and so i looked at them differently as if mm. that girl who was me could be my kids or any kids or any girl yes yeah, so you've read them through a bit more of a more compassionate eyes than the when you're right. an adult with children because we do we have this bigger heart when we have our own children don't we life changes beyond words when we have our own children yeah exactly it does and so where do you think that self-hatred came from as a child oh well personally i mean i mean it's it's very specific i mean do you want specifics or whatever you're happy to tell us yeah i mean i was first of all i didn't have a dad really at all i never saw him and so my mother had bunches of different boyfriends and um i don't know my mother was a real beauty and i was always told that i wasn't pretty as her <laughs> by her and by everyone else mm. and then also um we were in a situation where she was very young and her in-laws paid child support not my dad because he was you know Mm -hmm. didn't make any money at all um and i always i guess i always felt like i was always very conscious of that Mm -hmm. and i was very conscious because my aunts would tell me so like that someone else was paying for us Mm -hmm. and so i kind of felt like i didn't deserve anything that i was beholden to everyone who's supposed to take care of me, that it was kind of a duty for them. Mm -hmm. So I I felt constantly insecure and um, as if that security, what little security I had could be taken away at any time. And also we moved like every year. So it was a very, it was insecure. Yep, unsettled childhood and things. Because as and as parents now, the way we bring our children up, it's quite hard, don't you think, for teenagers as well? Because when you're in that, it's hard to admit that your parents might not be doing the best job for you. It's There's a lot of shame that comes with that. And it's a really hard discussion to talk about, especially for teens, isn't it? Like, I've suffered from self-hatred. I actually didn't like myself until I was 38 years old. And I slapped myself around the face and went on my own personal journey then. By that time, I'd been a mother for 16 years. Do you know what I mean? But... Um, and I know where all that self-hatred comes from, but my parents were doing the best they could at the time with the tools that they had. But to be told that you're not as pretty as your mum and to be in a, in competition with your own mother for something like that, that's trauma for a child, isn't it? It's Yeah, it, it makes you feel like you, you might as well not live because you're you're just not good enough. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. And when we look at our children, you wonder how anybody could even say that to you because when you look at your own child and they're the most beautiful things in the whole wide world, there's just no comparison between you and them, is there? Well, there shouldn't be, but there's a shoulda, woulda, coulda. Right, exactly, Mm. right. Yeah. There's a really good book called The Fuck You Up and I read it and it, it talks about your parents and how they basically fuck you up and then it goes into the next journey, the next generation about also we fuck up our children and that life journey of actually understanding that no parent's a perfect parent and when you're a parent yourself, I mean my children were all abducted under the age of four and we had a year in court, I've published a book about it but the story that they've been through, you know, the self-hatred, the self-loathing, there's um, the words that you use is 
they despise themselves as a sense of being ugly in that because of their story. It doesn't matter what our story is in many ways. Some are worse than others and the trauma we carry are worse. But I think it's quite significant that we admit as parents we will fuck up our children in some way, don't we? We do. Yeah, I'm for sure we do. And sometimes we do it trying to protect them because <laughs> you get into situations where you just really don't know what to do. You don't know, you know, if the kid is smoking pot or taking drugs, mm -hmm. you freak out and you don't know if it's their friends, you don't know if it's their opinion of themselves, you don't know what's going on. And I mean, yeah, I mean, my, my younger child, it was scary because here in the United States, we have a huge problem with heroin overdoses. and three of her friends died of heroin overdoses wow. in high school. And so, wow. you know, and I think I probably was pretty, I tried to be protective. I was probably overprotective and who knows how, I mean, who, how that affected her because I was getting divorced at the time. And of course she ran to her dad because he, he was not protecting her in the same way. Mm -hmm. And so then maybe my, here I'm admitting all these things, you know, you don't, you try your best, but you don't know. Yeah. You don't know. And you don't know. And exactly. We just do try our best every day, don't we? But there's, there's different types of traumas that we carry around with us. So when you were, went back as an adult and you read the book, and obviously you 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 there you weren't in such a place of self-hatred by the time you're an adult so you could read them through a more compassionate eyes was it a what is was it then really therapeutic writing the book did was that a form of therapy for you people often have asked me that and the answer is um not really and I say that because there were a lot of risks involved. I mean, I exposed my, myself, um, as is my want, foolishly. No, um, so I think after that book was published, you know, I was interviewed a bunch of times and always asked, you know, is it true? Is it true? You know, people would focus on that instead of, the quality of the book or, mm -hmm. or even the particular content. And so that was just like, um, I couldn't understand why that would matter because when I wrote it, I really did. I was writing it from a place where Minnie, the main character was no longer me mm -hmm. to me, she was like any girl. And I cared about her. Yeah. Um, and so, the question of whether or not she was me um, became kind of, it was so frequently repeated that I just kind of, uh, I don't know how that affected the therapy part of it, except it made me feel like the exposure was somehow I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. It was an extremely brave thing for you to write your story. And I know you weren't the same person when you wrote it. So you're coming at it from a very different perspective. But it's still a hugely brave thing to put that truth of you as a teenager out there. So then when people are then coming to you going, is this you? Is this you? That's quite confronting as well. And actually, the answer is yes and no, isn't it? Because yes, it was you. But no, it's not you as the writer is who you are now. So... It's right. a hard question to answer, really, isn't it? And, and in order to really craft the book, I had to kind of separate from that other self. Yeah. Um, Interesting. So, when you write yeah. a book, though, you're just writing about a snippet in time, focusing on one particular story or element, aren't you? And there's many other stories going on at the same time. It's your friendships at yeah. school, and there's the teachers, and there's there's the life that you're having, maybe playing sport or involved in music. So you're just choosing one particular story to write about. But then people will focus on that and actually can possibly create that into your identity. Whereas your identity is not that one story. Your identity is the journey of lessons that you go on through all the stories mm -hmm. and you become somebody different, don't you? But I think sometimes, I mean, yeah. certainly for me, I wrote about a particularly 
traumatic event in my life and people would associate me today being that person and I'm not. Right. Yeah, there is that confusion there. Right. Although if I, t- I was kind of laughing when you were saying you have your music and you have your sport and all that stuff. I, <laughs> I had none of those things. I didn't do any extracurricular anything and I get kicked out of four high schools. So I went to a different school every year. Mm-hmm. So, um, so as I guess I kind of failed on that. So yeah, so my whole life probably was kind of just obsessed with it, everything the character is obsessed with in the book. Yeah, but that isn't that. But isn't that true to somebody who is in trauma? So therefore, we go and search for love and acceptance, and we can't. You know, like children who maybe are really into their sport or into music when they've got a passion or they've got a mentor they're more likely to stay on a certain path where then there's people like, and I really relate to you as well because I turned to boys at a young age. I had a teenage pregnancy when I was 14 and had to have a hideous termination because I went to look for love and acceptance in the wrong place. Right, right. And did you did you get it though? Did I get it? No, of course not. You don't get that age 14 from a young boy, do you? But then and then I was going out with older men as I grew up and... The only place you get love and acceptance from is yourself, isn't it? Right, but that's... When you're a teenager, I think all the other possibilities are so exciting. You always hear that, you know, it's Mm -hmm. important to love yourself before you can love someone else. But you just don't believe it because Mm -hmm. the light bulb has just gone on. And, you know... So how do we help our teenagers love themselves? How do we do that? Because I know you've put your story out there and it's like, it it might not be therapy for you, but you felt there was a really big need for your story to be out there hence why you published the book was it to help right. teenagers so, so it was therapeutic for me in the sense that I, I had lots of people telling me that they saw themselves in the book mm-hmm. and that they were glad I'd written it and that they felt that I was writing about them and even though they didn't have the same experiences they had similar thoughts and and feelings mm-hmm. so that was therapeutic for me because it felt good it felt like I had done, done something good connected yeah. with people who I would probably never see, you know. Yeah. So that was good. I was just going to ask you. So the the film was adapted. How did it feel when you looked at her, who was playing you? Did you relate to her in the story? Was it? Did you feel it was accurately portrayed? What were the kind of feelings well, and emotions? Okay. Well, well, actually, the strongest experience I had in relation to that was when they did a, a play at first. The director did a stage play. And she invited me to see the walkthrough or the read through before it was ever produced. And um, I think I flew all the way to Los Angeles to see it. And I was really nervous. I was just kind of shitting bricks. Can I say that? Yes, you can. Um, (laughs) And um, I I didn't know what to expect. I, I was mostly afraid that it would be terrible and I would hate it and I would regret ever giving her the right to do it and I was just and (laughs) I did a funny thing I stayed the night in Hollywood in the room where Janis Joplin died and I did it on purpose because I love Janis Joplin and I mean since I was like 14 like you know after she was already dead for years. I didn't even know who she was when she died, so. But anyway, I just always had this obsession with her. It it makes me feel good to listen to her music. And um, so anyway, I stayed in the room where she died and it made me feel good. I can't tell you why, it just did. And then I went to the play the next day and it was such a strange experience. Because people weren't even on stage, they were just in a circle, like reading their parts. And I was sitting there and I was practically crying because it, somehow the actors had um, really, ex- they were expressing the characters so well that. It, I felt like I was watching ghosts of the past, like before my eyes. And I felt like I should be able to go up and talk to them <laughs> and have them respond as if, you know, I just saw them yesterday. Mm-hmm. It was really weird. 
So, um, and the movie was like that to a certain extent too. I, I love the movie. I think it's a great movie. Um, as far as an interpretation of the book, I think it, the movie kind of puts a, a cleaner, happier spin on the story. Um, kind of gives Minnie more agency than she probably had. So it's not exactly true to the book, but it's a good movie. So yeah, I was really happy with it. It was fun. And I was on I... set all the time. Can I ask yeah. you what kind of feedback you get from teenagers from the movie? Is it very similar to the book that they relate to it? They can see themselves in it. They feel a sense of relief because somebody else has been through what they are going through right now. I don't know. The, the letters I get are primarily about the book. And when you get letters back about the book, it is very much a sense of um, identity that they can identify with what you went through so that it helps them on their journey. It's very empowering yeah. for teenage girls. Exactly. Or they just felt like someone had heard them. Mm -hmm. I mean, not literally, but someone understood them. Yeah. Which is great because they're probably at that stage in their life, you know, be Whatever we're going through in life, we often feel lonely, don't we? Because we feel like we're the only person experiencing that. So if they can grab a tool like your book or watch the movie and go, oh gosh, I'm actually, it's not just me. I'm not abnormal. That's actually a really great message to give to the teens, isn't it? Sure, yeah, it is. Mm. Now tell me, you guys, one or both of you are counselors for teenagers? Both of us work with teenagers, yeah. We're so both. I've got my own company, Teenage Toolbox, and I taught in schools for 15 years and worked in prisons as well with women that are mainly murderers. And Joe works in schools as well, empowering teenagers. So, And we've got eight teenagers between us, so we've done a lot of work with teenagers and we kind of know that whole identity confusion that they go through. And I just love this. I was watching something on you earlier and you said... There's a quote you said, you said, nothing had changed in my life, but everything felt totally different. And that's a really interesting concept for me, that these teenagers growing up in environments and, and family homes that they've known through their childhood often, but they feel so different. They go through those, that hormonal stage where everything is totally different and they feel so out of control. Obviously, the hormones are raging, the peer group's got put pressure on, there's academic pressure, sort of... Everything changes, doesn't it? And yet nothing's really changed. I loved what you said. Thanks. Yeah, I don't remember when I said that. <laughs> it was very poignant when you did. Okay. But it's, okay. it's a very confusing time for teenagers, isn't it? It's, I think confusion is the biggest thing that I recognise in teenagers. Conf confused identity, confused future. There's pressure about careers. What are they going to do? Confusion about academic pressure confusion comparing themselves to each other there's so much pressure on teenagers and probably more so now with social media than ever before yeah no being a teenager probably sucks and always has i guess um there's also i mean the emotions are so strong you know yeah and they don't quite know how to deal with them changes on a dime you know and mm. it's not always clear why so um but they're the strongest emotions you might have in your life. Mm -hmm. And um, so everyone, everything, every moment seems so dire. Yeah. So, I mean, when you talk to teenagers, it's like everything is, they're easily threatened and any little thing is the end of the world. Yeah. Because you know? so, they work very much from their emotional brain, not their right, intellectual brain. It's not just, like that because no. that's what they, they that's, it really feels like that. Totally. So, you know. So I'm interested in yourself. So you obviously went from a place of self-hatred. They're your words. You totally self-hated yourself as a teenager. Yet later on years to come, you're a mother. You, you're a mother of two children. You're compassionate. You can see yourself as a teenager through more compassion. How did you get to a place where you didn't hate yourself? What tools did you use? I think it came like after high school. I finally went to college. And after doing very badly in high school, like I probably, on paper, it looked like I never should have gone to college. Um, but when I did go to college, I suddenly, I think because I was in control, I could choose what classes I was taking. I was living on my own. It just became fascinating for me. And I suddenly loved school. And I loved drawing. And the better I got at drawing, the more people would say, oh, 
you draw good, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I realized that, well, yeah, I can do this. I can do that. And, but as a teenager, I wasn't in a situation where I was getting any of any like pats on the head for any of those things. Yeah. So, um, anyway, so it took being independent and it took going to college. I mean, not every kid will want to go to college. I mean, maybe somebody will get a job or whatever they're going to do. But when you realize what you can do for yourself or by yourself, then suddenly you have aspirations and you realize you could do more yeah. and the world's your oyster. But it takes a long time to believe in yourself. It takes repetition of, I mean, I guess you always, any teenager, even if they hate themselves, they, it's very hard for them. I think every teenager has hope somewhere. Okay. And it's, and they're going to deny it and they're going to say everything sucks and you know, but they have it. Yeah. Well, and if they're lucky, it won't be totally like squelched out by the time they're adults and they can find themselves. You know? I think everybody who wakes up in the morning has an element of hope within them. And then if you find like what you're saying is you basically found something, you found something you were good at, you realized that you were good at drawing. Somebody else gave you that validation and told you you were good at drawing. So as teachers as parents as mentors one of the best things we can do for our teens is to tell them how awesome they are i think isn't it you know like and they don't have to be awesome because they're good at something they just have to be told that they're accepted for who they are and then i think once they're in a safer environment they're much more likely to find something like drawing or music or sport that they're good at something that can inspire them for the future right although I was kind of in a bad situation as a teenager, and I think I drew a lot then. And I think at that time, that kind of saved me. Mm -hmm. And I was, it was not at all public. No one ever saw what I was drawing. Mm -hmm. I would always hide my drawings because I was doing comics, and they were kind of about things I didn't want anyone to know about. Yeah. So, um, so you can have secret talents that people don't know about. It could be your writing. It could be the songs you're thinking of or singing. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to be on the glee club. You don't have to be like the star of the school play and you can still end up being a star in the real world. You know, Absolutely. high school is not the be all and end all. No, and that's, that's the message that we give to the children that come in our contact with, because a lot of parents and a lot of teachers like, you know, you've got to get your education. It's the most important thing in the world. Actually, it's not because we've got like the highest teen suicide right here in New Zealand. It's not the most important thing. I'm sorry. When you fall into education, you start to like it. Then it can become really important to you, like yours did after high school. You know, I also left school at 16 and I did okay at school, but then I chose a career and I went and studied at night school for three years because it was my choice. I was in control. It's like education is not the most important thing, is it? It yeah. helps in a lot of situations, don't get me wrong, but it's not the be-all and end-all. I think we've got to relax up about that and just allow our teens to be a bit freer. Right, and I mean, and with your own kids, it's just for them knowing that you love them is really important. Mm -hmm. I mean, some parents go overboard saying, oh, you're great, that's great, everything they do, when in reality, maybe it's not really that great, but they're hearing this all the time and they know that it's hollow. It doesn't help them believe in themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, they like to be told that, but yeah, you know, the world will tell them how good it is somehow or another. Yeah, I think we've um, got to be true and authentic as well. We can't yeah. we can't lie to our kids, but we've still got to tell them that they're special and they're loved for who they are. We don't necessarily have to even like them all the time, do we? But we have to know, no. they, they yeah. need to know that they're loved and they need to know there's boundaries. But also right, that they, yeah. they can't go on this journey of the fulfilling parents' expectations and school expectations are part of being a teenager is it's, it's experimenting, isn't it? And you've talked quite a lot about secrets. You didn't want people to see your drawings. You didn't want people to read your diaries. And you also said earlier when you were talking about now maybe children don't write diaries, they're on social media, Instagram, but they're password protected. Teenagers live partly in a very secret world because they're experimenting with sex, drugs, identity and everything else. And that's a part of the journey that needs to be honoured and respected by parents and adults and peer group because that's how we find our identity, by 
realizing we made mistakes there that didn't work for us or we tried that out and it's not what we want to do or we've tried that out and actually that is what we want to do and so that secret world of teenagers is also quite isolating because you're experimenting you're trying things out and you need to and I think adults actually nowadays need to honor or respect that a bit more that we did that as children ourselves we actually experimented we had our secret lives but we always don't want our teenagers to we want them to be safe and secure and it's not about being safe and secure is it no it's about just giving them knowledge about what's right and wrong but also you know trying to just keep them safe but let them go out and experiment let them make mistakes but actually let them know that you're there for them through their mistakes you know you're not going to turn your back on them just because they've made a mistake not right exactly Mm. so i've got an interesting question for you how how did you find raising your own teenagers through their journey what was that like oh man um it was wonderful and surprising i mean they're both like in their 20s now and they're wonderful and i just i'm so proud of them i love them so much um i thought that my older child would be like me. I was just thinking, oh my God, when she's a teenager, she's gonna be, it's gonna be so difficult. And I was so like nervous and and just prepared for that because she was always really hyperactive and I was always hyperactive too. And and so I was just, okay, this is gonna happen. I'm just gonna have to figure it out. But the opposite happened. She was like the perfect student. I don't think she ever lied to me. Or if she did, I never even suspected it. And I was waiting for it, but <laughs> it just never happened. I don't think she smoked pot. She always got A's. She came home on time. It was like the shock of my life. <laughs> and then, but then my younger daughter, I mean, she had a different situation because I was getting divorced and I think it was really traumatic for her. But I kind of thought, well, she'll be just the same because I was wrong about the first one. So the second one will be good too. Wow, how weird. But of course, no, the second one wants to be a gangster. You know, she, <laughs> she's covered with tattoos and it looks really cool, but it's like, you know, <laughs> it, it, she was just a totally different personality and a totally different set of um, challenges. So I think as a parent, you, you just don't know what you're gonna get you, you get individuals is what you get thank god mm-hmm. and the message and, is that there's no formula is there you can't put an expectation on any of your children or say that because you behaved a certain way they might or because they've had similar parenting they might turn out the same there's no formula and i say to parents look your teenagers have never been teenagers before and you've never parented teenagers before so you're both going on the journey it's a journey of the teens it's a journey for the parents as well isn't it we go on that journey with right. them And if you have more than one, you've never parented that particular person who's about to become a teen. You know, they're so different. They are. You know? But that's what makes life so rich, isn't it? All of these crazy personalities all lumped together and we all have to learn how to deal with each other. It's fucking crazy. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. So if you were to put a message out there to a teenager listening today who's going on a journey of struggle and confusion, what would your message be to them as a as a, a young adult that remembers her teenage years as a mother of your own teenage children, what would your message be to those girls that are listening today and in struggle? I guess I'd want them to know that they're okay. And it sounds strange to say I'm sending them love, but I love them. I don't know them. Mm-hmm. And, um, Also, have faith in yourself and realize that anything you want to do is going to take a lot of hard work. It's not going to come automatically. It might look like things come automatically to other people, but anything really worth having takes time, it takes work, Mm -hmm. and you're worth it. Um, I love that because there's, there's always a message. You can be whoever you want to be. You can do whatever you want to do, but then you sit there thinking, well, how do I do that? It seems impossible, but actually your message is that Actually, it's, it's quite difficult. Life is hard and it's not going to come easily to you. But point in a certain direction and set your targets, set your goals and work towards it because nothing's going to fall in our laps, is it, ever? No, no. 
and it's not straightforward. Well, you're lucky if it does. Yeah. Might, yeah. Don't expect it. Yeah. yeah. And I even find with, you know, 20 year olds and 25 year olds, 27 year olds, I think there's a concept that they've gone through the teen years and therefore they're not a teenager anymore. Therefore it's easy. They're now an adult and it's easy, but it's not. Yeah. Life doesn't yeah. ever get a lot easier. Obviously the hormones settle down and a lot of the confusion dies away, but actually life isn't straightforward for anybody. And it's, are we resilient? What are the tools and techniques we can use to get through? So some of the foundational stuff in teenage years is trying to find a way through, but you don't suddenly become an adult and therefore everything's perfect and okay. Well, it ain't perfect for me and I still, <laughs> I'm still learning every day. So there you go. Right, exactly, me too. Yeah, we're on a journey, aren't we? So, but I think it just, the more tools you have, the best. It, Best, the best mm. chance you've got isn't it mm. yeah we absolutely love people that are putting their message out there we love connecting with real life stories we love people that are prepared to be vulnerable and say look this is my story and I'm not perfect today these are the lessons I've learned I'm prepared to share my lessons and tools with you but our message to les listeners really is everyone's got a story and we're interviewing people with all different walks of life different totally. backgrounds it's so we find it really exciting mm. hearing stories like yours so we think you were really brave to put your story out there because it is a really brave thing to do because you know we've all had we all have a past we all have stories so anybody who puts their story out there for the world to judge them good way bad way whatever because that's what ultimately happens people judge you so well done you for being brave and congratulations on it all being made into a film and everything. It's fantastic. Mm, it's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And another piece of advice to teenagers, it's never a bad idea to keep a diary because it, it really, you are on an important journey now and things will change and it'll be valuable for you later on. Mm, so yeah. you can't be honest with anyone else. Be honest with yourself and write it down yeah that's Love beautiful it. and also yeah, yeah and, it's th and that's therapy in itself you get those words out onto the paper somebody's listened to you haven't they? even if it's just your adult self you've listened to yourself Exactly, yeah. So, yeah that's I lovely. love it. Phoebe, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm inspired to go and dig my own diaries out, <laughs> see what's Do in it. them. Do I it. will, I know. Yeah. I'm just open that container and find them because there's a, there's a whole box of them. But you're such an inspiration. I know you'll have encouraged so many listeners today. So thank you so much for coming on board. Okay, thanks for having me. It was lovely to see your lovely faces. <laughs> okay. Thanks so much for being with us today. For us to inspire others to live their magnificently imperfect life, please subscribe and leave us a five-star review on iTunes or on your podcast app. You can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Pods with Posh and Paul. We can't wait for you to join us on our next episode. Love, light and peace.